Okay, now it started. Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the course BC212 on Christian apologetics. Um, we come to the very end of this course. Uh, so we are most likely going to finish um, things today, just depending on how much interaction we have. But uh, let's take a moment and pray together and then we'll get started. Could I please request somebody to just pray with us as a class and then we will start. Anybody could pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the class we are about to have, Lord. Uh, God, we pray that uh, you will open our mind and heart and help us to listen to each and every word that Pastor says. We ask the Holy Spirit to invade this class. Help us to understand the deepest meanings, God. You called us, you called us to preach your gospel. Help us to uh, grow more in you, Jesus. Grow more in your knowledge. Uh, I bless Pastor Ashish in Jesus' name as he teaches. God, uh, be with him and guide him and uh, throughout the class give us the good uh, Wi-Fi connections and all the other things that we need. Let this class be done for your glory and let this class bring your praise Jesus. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone. So we were in the very last um, lesson where we were talking about social challenges i'm going to go ahead and share the notes pdf so that we can um, quickly review and then move forward on the um, topics we want to cover so when we talk about social challenges um, of course there are many many kinds of themes and topics and areas where uh, there are challenges and uh, people are looking to see what the church, what believers are saying about those matters. And why should we be even be involved? Because the Bible tells us that um, the church, this is in uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, it tells us that we are, the church is, an, is the upholder of truth, is the foundation and upholder of truth in society, so in, in this world. So, that means the church has to uphold and support truth in the midst of all the things that are going on around us in this world. And so we have to speak the truth in love. We have to say this is what the truth is concerning many of these matters. Now, what we did last week was we said, okay, you know, let's give ourselves a framework uh, from the Word of God. Uh, based on who we see God is and what He's given to us in His Word, so that we can use that as a guide to help us arrive at our decisions or conclusions. So we said, you know, when we look at how God deals with the world, with sinners, He does not override other people's choices or human will. God communicates what's right and wrong, but He leaves, uh, He says, okay, you make the choice. He's willing to reason together. That means you come and you share what you have to say. Say what you have to say, and God is willing to answer. He treats everybody with love and fairness. He makes the sun to shine on the good and evil. He makes the rain to fall on the good and evil. So he treats everyone with love and fairness, even those who are not you know, walking according to his ways. And he does not, but God does not compromise himself. That means he doesn't go against himself. His truth is sure. He's holy. He's just, he's love, he cannot go against that. So this forms our framework based on which we then try to, you know, uh, look at different areas and arrive at um, uh, uh, an answer for those areas. Now, we have to acknowledge that there are many things which the Bible doesn't specifically mention. You know, a lot of things, and we are, we'll be covering many of those things today. So in those cases, what we, how are we going to you know, say what's right and wrong? How are we going to arrive at some conclusion? Well, we're going to understand the nature and character of God, like we said earlier. And if there's anything 
the general instruction scripture, even if it's not specifically specifically on this matter, if there's something in relation to it, what is the scripture saying? And then we use our framework, you know, do what is just, fair and right for every person. And then we arrive at a conclusion. And then when we communicate this, uh, we say, look, it's my opinion, or it's my understanding, right? Because there is no particular chapter and verse that we are referencing. We are just saying, look, we've tried in our best to put everything together and we're arriving at this conclusion or this decision. So we're not saying this is God saying, we are saying it's our opinion, right? Because we can't point to a particular chapter and verse on that matter. So having given that kind of understanding, we said, okay, let's talk about specific social issues. We we dealt with marriage and homosexuality and same-sex marriage and you know how that affects various scenarios. You know, even now we were dealing with um, you know uh, business situations, uh, office situations, political situations, and then local church situations. So many, you know, just that area will then affect so many other uh, or that one uh, point marriage and homosexuality and same-sex marriage then affects so many areas in in everyday life we also mentioned or spoke about divorce and how we have to look at it um, and and then how to be you know we, we have to love the people uh, yeah they may have gone through some of these things in life and uh, we're not saying you know it's the best, but we have to love them and let them know that God still loves them in spite of what they've got. So we've covered till here, and we're going to go forward on other topics today. The next uh, topic we can look at is about abortion. Now, is it wrong? What about you know special situations and so on and so forth? There's a lot of debate on it. Now, now, at a very basic level, we say, yeah, abortion is wrong because it's taking away the life of a person, though the baby is still unborn. It is actually you're killing an innocent life, right? So yes, at that very le basic level, um, it, it is wrong. And uh, um, in all cases that we mentioned, you know, Sometimes unmarried people get pregnant. Sometimes they feel like, oh, it's too early. We didn't plan for this. Sometimes, you know, so we didn't plan for the child. And so these are not valid reasons to abort a child. Because these are, in many ways, preventable, right? Or uh, uh, it happened but it's not a sufficient reason to take away the life of an innocent child. Now, the fact is there are people who still, it has happened, you know, for whatever reason, they choose to abort a child. And then if they've gone through it, we don't condemn or judge them. I mean, we know it's wrong. It's not right to take away the life of an innocent child, but unborn child, but we don't condemn them they've already gone through it we can't change it we can uh, lead them to a place of experiencing god's mercy and forgiveness talk to them about it uh, let it not become a repetitive behavior you know uh, so that's something we can do we can't undo what they have already done in the past you know we, we have to be merciful um but so have Having said that, then there are other situations that we also have to talk about, which, for example, what if it's medically life-threatening? You know, so either the life of the mother, in many cases, if the life of the mother is at risk in this particular pregnancy. So that's one scenario to think about. Or other complications where, you know, nowadays because we can do the scans and 
all those kinds of tests. The doctor will do the tests, and then the doctor may tell the parents, you know, the baby is, you know, it's not being formed, it's a deformed. The baby has serious problems or various things. And the physicians, the doctors are recommending an abortion. So what to do in such situations? Right. Now, here's what I would suggest. Now, the Bible is not, you know, we know the, the word of God says, Thou shall not kill, don't kill. That is a command of God. But now, here you have a situation where, example, the doctors are saying the life of the mother is at risk. And what if the mother already has a, another child to take care of? If she dies, both she and the baby die during the pregnancy, then who will take care of that other child? I mean, yeah, the father is there, but you know, uh, don't we need to have the mother alive for the sake of the other child? Those are questions, you know. Or um, if the baby's having complications, and doctors are saying, okay, this baby will not survive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, do we take their advice and abort the child? You know, so or if the child is born, and uh, then this, you know, and this survives few days or whatever, you know, few, whatever short period of time, so on. A lot of things are there, medically speaking. So, what should we do in such situations? We don't have. Uh, a chapter and verse for it. Uh, then there are other cases where there is a rape. You know, that means uh, this woman was violated, and it results sexually violated and results in pregnancy. Now she didn't want to have the child; she's it was forced upon her. Maybe she's not ready to take care of the child. Maybe she doesn't have the means to take care of the child, and. What about the person who did it? He may have escaped, and he's not taking any responsibility. So that's another situation to think about. So we know it's wrong to kill, but then what about these kinds of situations? So what I propose, and again, I'm saying my when I say I propose, I'm saying it because this is what I think. I'm not saying this is. You know, chapter and verse. I feel uh, we shouldn't be fixed on a certain answer because every case is different. The people involved, you know, the the parents involved, uh, they we should give them the freedom to make the choice. So, example, you know, uh, husband and wife. Uh, the, 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 uh, the wife is scaring, and the doctors say, look, this is very, for whatever reason, you know, the doctors may do all the tests and all that, and they have the reason that the medical advice is it's life-threatening. Uh, the doctor would advise uh, an abortion termination of the pregnancy. For this, you know, whether it's life-threatening or other complications, so the medical field is giving the parents some advice. What should we do? Well, we should just let the parents make the decision. You know, okay, you decide. Do you pray? And don't feel guilty either way. Because, you know, for example, in one scenario, the mother needs to live to take care of, you know, maybe they have already have one or two children, and uh, the mother needs to live to take care of them and be there for them. They need a mother. So then, the husband and wife may decide, okay, we'll terminate this pregnancy so that, you know, uh, the mother can be safe and take care of the child or the children they already have. So that could be a decision they make. And uh, so in a situation like this, my suggestion would be that we don't enforce our ideas on people. See, because God doesn't force his force things on he lets people make the choice and uh, you know and we say that you know you listen to god and you be at peace and we won't judge them either way you know 
we won't say, oh, you didn't have enough faith to believe that God will heal the child or God will protect a mother's life. Or we don't judge them like that. It's not right. It's between them and God. Right. So we just encourage them. You seek God. You do what you feel at peace in your heart to do. And we are not going to judge you either way. Either way you go, we're not going to judge you. But we will stand with you to support you. The same thing when a woman is raped, you know, this is a very painful experience, you know, uh, and, and we just, we can't force our idea and say, okay, don't terminate this child, it's a, a human being. You know, it's easy to say that, but she, she, it was against her will, she was violated. So, and she may not be ready in so many things, and the man who did it may have disappeared, run away somewhere, we don't know whatever happened. So we can't put that burden on the woman. So again here, you know, my, my suggestion is don't force the decision. Uh, we let this woman, let her make the decision. You know, she may choose to terminate the pregnancy. She may choose to have the baby and give the baby out for adoption. Or she may choose to have the baby and bring the baby up in spite of what has happened. You know, that is entirely her choice, whatever she decides to do. And she needs she needs to feel at peace about whatever decision. And we will just, you know, uh, without condemning her, because she's been through a very fain, painful experience. It was against her will. And so therefore, uh, we will just let her make her decision in peace and and uh, and and just support the person through you know what they have to go. So there are cases where we can very clearly say no. You know it's not right. You know uh, uh, it, this can be prevented. It's not right. There are cases where we have to let the people involved make their decision. And you know in the end. Uh, we realize that there are people who have gone through it, either you know, before, before they became believers, or sometimes even after they become believers, they make choices. Um, we shouldn't condemn them or judge them, and just uh, you know, be kind, be merciful to them, in spite of that life experience. So this is what I wanted to share here on, on this matter of abortion, and let me pause and see if there are any questions on this or in this regard and uh, we can go forward any questions here uh, anybody wants to um, ask specific questions on this topic it's not an easy topic there's a lot of uh, challenges around the world politically you know socially uh, a lot of uh, things are happening on the subject of, of abortion but I think, uh, you know, we, if we, we are clear in our minds how to approach this, we can do it without being judgmental, without being harsh on other people. And, uh, you know, at, at the same time, we have to stand for what is right. Uh, we cannot just randomly kill, you know, the unborn child. That's not right. Any questions on that? Uh, Pastor, uh, my question is not on abortion, but there was one situation, uh, once uh, one of my close relatives, uh, she had twins, and uh, unfortunately there were some weaknesses or something they were going on, and so they sent a prayer request to all our family, to all the pastors they knew, uh, to pray for the child, uh, that they will get back well soon. But we prayed for a day and then again and again. And at last, the, the both the twins were dead. So they were believers. They believed in God. They prayed over the child. And everything was good. And in the end, uh, we all were in a situation we don't know uh, how to comfort them, what to say to them. And so in such situation, uh, how can we still tell them that God is there, Jesus is your hope, is the way, because they were expecting this child for a long time, praying over it every day, and uh, 
we just didn't know how to comfort them. So I just mm. wanted to ask that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So this, the, you know, this is again um, a real situation where uh, a situation where it's very, you know, it's a very painful, painful experience to journey through, especially for the parents. And um, in in matters in a, in a situation like this, it's important for us not to to blame anyone. You know, so and theologically, so we can say, okay, theologically, I mean, it's from the Bible, and look at it from a biblical perspective. We know God hasn't changed. God is true to His word. His word is truth, and. Uh, any failure is a failure on our side, not on God's side. But we can't, we should not point a finger at anybody and say, because of your unbelief or because of your lack of faith or because you didn't have enough faith or because there was sin in your life, you know, this happened. No, that's the wrong thing to do. We shouldn't do that. So we should accept that, yeah, okay, we, you know, we failed. God is still the same. His word is still the, still truth. So what we, in, in a way to encourage them, uh, so one is, you know, when they're going through it, that's not the time to give very deep theological answers or anything. That That's the time just to say, hey, we love you. We, to just to be there. And sometimes being quiet, silent, and just being there physically is more comforting than saying a lot of things. So when something like that happens, just say, hey, we are there with you. We we still love you. You know, and just sometimes not even say anything. Be there if people can be around them physically, just to be with them and help them through it. And then, you know, they there was so, because there's so much pain and grief at that you know moment. And as they journey through it, you know, then later on, uh, you know, let's say maybe a week or so later, then they're going to ask the question, why did this happen? Of course, they're going to be asking the question right from the moment it happened, but that's not the time for us to try and give answers. That's the time for us to keep quiet and just stay with them, support them through it. And then, because they're grieving, there's a lot of pain. And then, you know, at a later point, maybe a week, two weeks, that's the time. If they, you know, based on relationship, we can say, hey, one thing we must always remember is God is faithful. God has not changed. His word is true. And we must still continue to look to him. Right? To remind them of the faithfulness of God, the unchangeableness of God. And in a very loving way, without pointing fingers, saying, letting them know that, God didn't fail, you know. Uh, but of course, any failure was on our side. But don't point any finger. Don't bring it to, with condemnation. The important thing is to encourage them to have faith in God, that God has not changed. And from our side, we will never know the answer. You know, for every case is different. Every case is unique. And uh, uh, is very different. And so we can't say, okay, this is the answer for every situation. No, we won't know the answers. It's okay. We don't need to know the answers. We just need to keep our eyes on the Bible, on the Word of God, and continue journeying through. So that's how I, you know, from as that's how I would say, you know, we journey with them through the situation without condemnation, without trying to answer questions. You don't need to answer. You just need to affirm, help them look to God, you know, at the right time. And especially in the initial days, just silent support is very powerful than the words we can speak at those moments. Is that okay? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Paul, you had something to say? I see your hand raised. Yes. <clears throat> uh, to me, I conquer with you as you say, we should not judge. Yeah, it is only God to judge. But the word of God is there to encourage us. And the word of God is truth, is knowledge, and is life. So to me, I would again differ. I would say at that time, this person need the word of God. 
word of mm. God to encourage us to build our faith, not to give the word later on after things have gone worse. We first give the word, and then that word can build faith in somebody before that somebody makes a decision. So at that time when it's passing through that hardship, I think that's the right time that person needs the word. Other than waiting later on, being silent, then later on we, we, we come we come in and out to comfort. It would be late. So for me, that is that is my stand. Mm. Thank so, you. Uh, Paul, were you were you referring to the case Jeffina mentioned, or were you referring to um, uh, the abortion situation? I just want to which which were you referring to? I was re referring to the abortion situation. Oh, okay. Yes. That of course I agree. Uh, you know we it it, it all depends, right? Uh, I mean my my thought is so. It, I mean uh, this current answer was in reference to Jeffina's situation. In reference to the abortion situation, it you know if it was the first three cases, uh, so I was trying to differentiate. Um, uh, I agree, we need to speak the truth. Uh, but here's what I wanted to say that we need to speak the truth in love, right? Uh, so if it's in the first three situations, yes, we we can clearly state it's wrong to take away your life because there's no valid reason. But in these situations, so I'm differentiating between the situations. In these situations where uh, somebody's life, you know, you have to make a choice either the mother lives or the baby lives, or both mother and baby die. And, you know, there is uh, another child or children to be taken care of, or in the case of a rape. So here's a second different set of situations. So what I was saying here is, you know, we don't want to force our ideas on somebody else. You know, we know there is life, life is important, but here in, in a situation like this where whose life is more important you know if the mother if, if medically in a situation where the mother's life is at risk the baby in the womb is at risk but then there are two other children or other children in the family who need the mother what do you do you know so this is so in this in these scenarios the second set that's where i was saying uh, we don't force our ideas. We can tell them, encourage, but we encourage them to listen to God. Right now, when I said I was talk, when I was talking about being silent, I was talking in reference to I was answering Jeffina's question, which is a different scenario where, where the babe, the ch the two children have already died, so um, that's a totally different situation. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I was just trying to differentiate. Here's one set of situations. Here's another set of situations. And Jeffina's situation was completely different, which is having to do with babies who have already died. That's when you know the, the death has already happened. Parents are going through the pain. That's the time to remain silent is what I was trying to say. So there are different three different scenarios that we were referring to. But thank you, Paul, for sharing your thoughts, and I respect that. Anything else? Anybody wants to say anything? Okay. Let's run through, you know, a few other situations. And again, these are all, uh, you know, what I would say as um, these are situations where we may not always have chapter and verse. Now, for example, climate change and environment. Um, we know that, okay, so here's the two different biblical perspectives that, are, that, that we see happening. There's one group of people who will quote Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and other scriptures like Psalm 115, verse 18, where it tells us God has put us to be stewards of the earth. You know, God told man, you know, go subdue the earth, you re replenish it, you take care of the garden. 
so on. So they're quoting chapter and verse, and they say, we are responsible for the planet, we have to take care of it. Then there's another set of people who would quote verses like Second Peter chapter 3, and Revelation 21, 22, and say that, hey, the Bible says God is going to destroy everything by fire. The world is eventually going to be destroyed. There are going to be new heavens and the new earth. So why are you worried about the environment and taking care of it and spending so much money on worrying, being worrying about climate change and environment and so on? And both are quoting chapter and verse. And these are, I'm talking about in the church, you find both sides, both groups of people. When it comes to this whole matter of climate change and taking care of the environment. So even within the church, there are, you know, there's a two groups of people who are looking at it from different perspectives. So the people who quote, you know, Second Peter 3 and Revelation 21, 22, they say, why, why, why bother, you know? So what if the you know climate change is affecting the environment and so on? So why worry? But then there's the other part, other side, like I mentioned, who say, look, we are stewards. Yes, we know God is going to renovate the, you know, make everything new. There's going to be new heavens and the yes, we know. But at least while we are here, we need to take care of the planet and uh, do our part. We know God, this is all going to be gone. But while we're here, let us be good stewards. So this debate is going on. My personal position is that we should be good stewards, right? That yes, we know that in the future there will be new heavens and the new earth. God will do it. But while we are here, we are fulfilling our responsibility, which God gave us in the Garden of Eden. He told us to take care of what he gave us. And so we do the best we can. We try to study, we start to research how to take care of it and do it. And do it because it matters to everybody. Everybody's affected. You know, if there are drastic weather changes, it affects the the uh, produce of crop in different parts of the world. It then affects availability of food and water and basic things. And so this matters to everybody. And so while we are here, let us be good stewards. So that's, you know, um, how I would like to think on this, but I am aware that, you know, there's there's the other side that looks at it very differently but we shouldn't become enemies with each other and that's a sad thing that uh, uh, this whole matter has become so political today that uh, it's almost uh, uh, like people fighting over each other fighting with each other on this matter and because there are a lot of vested interests you know and uh, it's it's uh, money is involved of course so it, it's become a very big political issue and so on. But from a biblical perspective, I think it's right to say uh, we should take care of the environment and be concerned or you know, invest time and effort into this. Any thoughts on that? Uh, any thoughts on climate change or thoughts or questions on climate change and uh, on this? So, Pastor, uh, so when there is a climate change, like let's say there is a disaster happening, like uh, an, an earthquake or flood, so it's it's obviously the work of Saturn, right? I, I just want to be. You know, is it is it the work of Saturn, like changing with the climate, like flood and all these disasters from Saturn, and so when we pray. Uh, does it really help in the time <laughs> to change the whole situation? Because uh, if there is a flood uh, in some place, we believers are encouraged to pray that the flood will be stopped and the earthquake will be stopped. But 
I'm just sometimes I'm not so sure like why mm. we are playing when people are actually dying in front of us mm. and uh, how does that help just some little doubts in my heart and I'm still, yeah. I'm still believing that God is good he's working everything together for good yeah just mm. wonder mm. yeah it's a valid question so remember uh in our previous chapter on suffering one of the things we mentioned this is based on Romans chapter 8 uh was uh, 18 to 23 we we said that uh, all of creation is in the bondage of corruption that means creation itself has been given over to a process of decay a deviation from its original um state of perfection so what's happening is um uh, there is god didn't de- design earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and uh, or vol- volcanic eruptions all these things that that was not the plan of god which destroys lives but it's happening because creation has deviated from its original design so that's one reason and that's the main reason i would say let's say maybe 90% of what happens in these weather phenomena is because of that very little we can directly attribute to satan right it's not like the enemy is causing the volcanic eruption or the earthquake or no everything's major things that are happening is because of that bondage to corruption bondage to decay the whole, all of creation has been subject to that and it's deviating it's not in the way god wanted it to be so that's 90% or more i'm just putting 90% as a number it's not a it's not a biblical number i'm just saying that the majority of what happens is because of that now in certain cases the enemy can be involved like we saw um, again this was in the previous lesson where satan caused certain phenomena to happen to destroy job's possessions so we saw okay the enemy is using weather elements to bring destruction so that that would i would say is a smaller percentage and then lastly we also see god when in in cases of judgment god would use these natural elements to carry out judgment so we have all three but the majority is because of this natural process of decay so when it when it comes to the that's why we pray or we exercise faith because we God has given us faith to deal with what has happened through the fall which is all these weather phenomena is happening we use our faith and we pray we try you know we 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 speak to the storm the winds the waves whatever is happening we pray and we do our part to help people right that's what and even in the case when it's a demonic things but when it's a case of god's judgment then the most important thing to do is repent repentance is needed is that okay yes best yeah. so this is where you know um, the soul stewardship of the earth is involved that is if we can take care of things we know everything is in decline in the weather phenomena in, in natural elements we know it's in decline but if we can do our part to alleviate further damage or further act, you know bad things happening let's do whatever we can that's being steward stewardship now let's move to another topic uh you know in the in 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 the in 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 what's actually happening in the world uh, all of these things a lot of debate happening you know a lot of things going on and i'm just mentioning it very briefly but things are very complicated in the world you know the when we talk about some of these topics but it's at least good to have a at least be clear on where we should where our position should be right now let's talk about a couple of few things here now how about organ transplant and i'll just share quickly some thoughts and we'll go forward organ transplant you know uh, one person you know their particular organ is damaged you know uh, and 
What if you take the organ from another person, a donor, put it into their body for the betterment of their health? Is that okay? Or are we playing God? That's the question, you know. Uh, so that is one thing. And is it right for a believer to have an organ transplant, right? Uh, a believer, maybe one of the kidneys are failing, so maybe a relative will donate, is willing to donate one of their kidneys. So is it right for a believer to have an organ transplant, or are we taking the place of God in doing this? Related to that is this whole, another big area of surrogacy. This is a very difficult thing where, you know, a couple, a married couple may not be, for whatever reason, you know, they're not able to have children. Sometimes, you know, the wife's health is not, uh, what to say, it's not, it will not support her to carry, will not enable her to carry, it's not safe for her to go through a pregnancy, but they want to have children. So what do they do? They donate their egg and sperm that's implanted in another woman's womb. Basically, she carries the child and you know delivers the child on their behalf. So that's a, is it the right thing to do or not? And now medical science has kind of perfected this whole thing. They say, yeah, it can be done, and they keep that it's happening all over the world. Uh, surrogate motherhood is happening, surrogacy is happening, and it's all going on. Now, is it right? You know, or are we doing something against God's design? Then, again, related to that, the third aspect is genetics. Now, in genetics, we're getting down to the level of the genes, the DNA within the cell, and uh, what is happening? Now, genetics can apply in so many areas. They're already doing it. For example, in agriculture, you have genetically modified plants and vegetables and fruits and so on. So they can modify the genes so that uh, the fruit can be better, it can be more flavorful, or the plant can go grow even during uh, adverse weather conditions. So many things have already been done. And today, it, you know, in the markets, in many parts of the world, the, the, the produce we're eating is actually, in, you know, in some cases, genetically modified. So the plant has, the gene of the plant has been edited, in some way to make it produce crop um, and uh, then the you know of course it's done so that people can have food to eat uh, even so that's happening now that is also being done say in for animals they're doing that for animals they're also now they have also been doing it in humans to treat so genetics one is to treat sicknesses so certain conditions, they edit the genes. So just like you know, we you know, and there is medications, there is surgery. Now it's going down to the level of treating at the genetic level, treating certain kinds of sicknesses. Then they are extending it to treating the unborn child. So the babies in the womb, they see the baby has a defect, so they can treat. The modify the genes in the child and treat it even before it is born. That is there. And so the big question is, is this okay? You know, how can we say there is no chapter and verse on these matters, but it is all happening around us. Science and medicine is they're doing these in science, and they're doing these things already, and uh, we are seeing it happen. And what do we say about these things, right? What should our response be? Now, again, here, 
because we don't have any chapter and verse, we have to try to come to the best conclusion we can uh, by asking the right kind of questions and thinking through it based on what we know about God and the scriptures. And, um, and even in this, there are different points of view. There are, as I said earlier, there are people who are okay with it, and there are people who say, no, you should not. I'm talking about within the church. And I've just given a link to a Catholic church. I'm not promoting the Catholic church, but I'm just saying this is what uh, they say, or some people in the Catholic church are saying. You can read it online if you're interested. And uh, But basically they're saying, look, the church needs to say something about the matter. Right? The church has to say, you know, take its position on these matters. And uh, so uh, in these three situations, what should our response be? What do you think? You know, I, I have my opinion, I can share my opinion, but I would like to hear from you. What do you think about organ transplant, surrogacy, genetic uh, treatments? You know, so many different, like I said, there's so many different kinds of treatments and they're continuing to discover more. Uh, so the use of gene editing for the betterment of life, whether it's in plants, fruit, vegetation, some amount they're doing in animals. Now they're also doing it in humans. So what are your thoughts on this? And again, I know there's no chapter in verse, so uh, we have to arrive at the best conclusion we can, but it'd be nice to hear your thoughts. Feel free to share, you know, I'm not, you're not gonna judge and condemn anybody <laughs> on your views, uh, but just for us to share our thoughts. Uh, in my opinion, I don't feel anything wrong about this. <laughs> it just makes our life better. And yeah, for I've never thought about it even. Mm. <laughs> never compared it with the compared it with the Bible. Mm. And so I think it's okay. Mm. So your initial reaction is because at the end of it, it's making life better. It's not harming anybody. It's not you know doing harm in any way it's only doing something good therefore based on that premise we can say yeah it's it's fine it's okay anybody else okay so i see your comments um john john paul says um I think it's okay, considering God himself as a source of all knowledge in progenetic modification. Zilatoli says, I'm okay with that as long as it's benefiting mankind. Okay, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Anyone else? All right. So I'll give you again, I'll give you my opinion. There is no chapter and verse on this. But I think I just agree with um, you know what all of you have shared that the way I look at it is, you know, as long as it is serving to help somebody, then it's all fine. You know, uh, for example, organ transplant, you're helping a person. Uh, they make their life, you know, maybe they live longer, so on and so forth. So perfectly fine. Surrogacy, yeah. Uh, couple, they want to have children, but for certain medical reasons, they're not able to. Okay, it's fine. We're not destroying anybody's life. They're having a, they're, their own children, but it's coming through a different way. Fine. Same thing with gene, genetic editing, gene, genetic modification, so on. So my perspective, like many of what many of you have shared, it is okay because the end result is we are helping people. We are helping them in some way. And we're using the knowledge of what God has created to, we're using the knowledge, we're using what God has enabled us to understand to make life better. So from that perspective, 
if we use this knowledge correctly to serve, to make people's life better, then we are perfectly fine with it. So that's you know that's basically our view on it. Again, we have we have to say, look, we don't have chapter and verse on this. If somebody else has a different view, we respect it. It's okay. We're not going to fight about it. But uh, you know, there's this this we look at it like this and we express our opinion without being judgmental on other people. Okay. So we have a few more topics. Um, uh, I just, you know, we would probably take maybe 10, 10 or more minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and so just comment on some of these other things. So let's go for a break and we'll come back and we'll just go through the other topics just to give us some thought on, uh, on these things. Okay. Uh, see you all in 10 minutes. Thank you.